What's up, everybody? I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief for Front Office Sports. Welcome back to the My Other Passion podcast. And today, we have an awesome guest, Will Blackman. He played in the NFL. He won a Super Bowl with the New York Giants. And now, he is exploring his passion and his love for wine. He does concierge service, he does personal shopping, and he has a company called The Wine MVP. That's really the backbone of his passion for wine. So without further ado, we're going to get into this conversation with Will Blackman. This is it, the putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours, and you think you will, but then on the backswing, your hat falls over your eyes, you can't see anything, and you know, if this is how you're running your business with poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and all this outdated finance software, you're going to need to see the full picture. And to do that, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system. It's going to give you a full picture of your business. And with that type of visibility and control, you can see your financials, your inventory, your HR, planning, budgeting, more. NetSuite is everything you need all in one place. One thing about NetSuite is you can automate your manual processes. So it makes it really easy to close your books in no time. You will stay well ahead of your competition. In fact, 93% of the survey businesses increase their visibility and control after upgrading to NetSuite. Don't you want that to be your business? There's over 31,000 businesses already using NetSuite. This summer, NetSuite has a special financing program. If you're ready to upgrade, it's netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. Again, netsuite.com slash my other passion. Head there for this special one of a kind financing offer on the number one financial system for growing businesses. Netsuite.com slash my other passion. So without further ado, I'm incredibly excited to bring on our latest guest on the My Other Passion podcast. Today we're here with Will Blackman, former NFL player, a wine connoisseur, so many other things. Uh, why don't we go ahead and get right into it, man? I want to talk about how it feels to win a Super Bowl. I want to talk about white or red or what we should know about, <laughs> you know, how it's supposed to go down when you're in the winery or in the vineyards. Um, but why don't you give people, you know, a little bit of background? I know people probably have seen you on the field. What's life been like these past several years? Yeah, it's been um, <clears throat> it's been super interesting. Uh, yeah, my background, you know, from Providence, Rhode Island, born and raised, went to Boston College, um, end up playing there and graduating with the English degree, which is which was probably the silliest thing I ever done because <laughs> to to uh, major in English and play uh, power five football was crazy. But I managed to get it done. Uh, got drafted fourth round by the Green Bay Packers. End up playing for them, the Giants, Jaguars, and at the time Washington Redskins. Uh, so I got me a. Um, a nice 12 year career, man, which, which is crazy. Cause I think the average is like two and a half, three, uh, right now. So to get 12, uh, it was, it was my dream job. It was everything I wanted to do. I was the typical, uh, kid who, uh, collected cars and jerseys and never missed a game, never missed a Super Bowl. I was like that crazy child. And to, and to actually do that and play the NFL that long what was cool. Um, yeah. And it was exciting. So, uh, managed to, uh, Win a Super Bowl with the New York Giants in 2011, uh, which was crazy because um, the year before I was in Green Bay and I actually ended up uh, tearing my ACL uh, during my contract year and then try to come back and get healthy that following year. And uh, this is 2010. And then I ended up getting released, and that's the same year the Giant, I mean, the Packers ended up winning the Super Bowl. But then y'all uh, had so to was, go through them the next year. The next year, yeah. But um, it it was a beast, you know, to to deal with that. I mean, my whole my whole story, my whole journey was just all about adversity and being resilient. And I think uh, like learning from those, like not letting those affect me enough where I don't want to play anymore, and, and learning from those. But that's that was a beast. But yeah, to well, come back well, the next year, I gotta ask. I mean, that's that's a hell of a story to just drop on us. What is it like? No, I know to be, <laughs> to be on a team. You get cut. They win the Super Bowl, so you must be feeling like some sense of missing out. Then you come no back. Sense. I, I was, no, but then you come back sense, and you bro. beat that, and you beat that same team to win a Super Bowl. Like that's crazy. Yeah. So it it was more than the sense, bro. I was, you know, when you're building a team in the NFL, it, it takes four years, and I was part of that entire four year plan. And year four is when I got released. Yeah. So come back the next year uh, with the Giants. It, I wasn't even thinking about, oh, we're, we're going to go to Green Bay and get revenge. I was just having so much fun with the team. 
uh, and we managed just to go ahead and, and, and get it done. So that was exciting. It was a dream come true, man. It's um, it, it really shows you uh, like what it takes and like as a full team to uh, one, everyone buy in, two, everyone handle adversity, and and three, everyone has to believe, you know. And and that's the cool thing with not just a team, but in family and business and life. Like it's it's those it's those things that help you. So yeah, so I end up doing that, playing with them, uh, the Giants winning, and then I end up going to Jacksonville and then finish with Washington. And um, yeah, that's that's my quick that's my football story right there. <laughs> well, before we talk uh, a bit more about wine and what you've been doing since. NFL, because that is what this pod is about, your other passions. Uh, we, we have to talk a little bit about winning a Super Bowl. I personally would like to know, how does that feel? Like, this is something you grow up dreaming about, right? You're in your backyard totally. playing catch, and you're like, oh, he's he gets to tackle. Like, you know, you do those things your whole life, and then to be in that moment, um, you know, what what did it feel like? I guess I'm always wondering, like, is there a point where it's just kind of like, cool, I got it, I'm proud of it, life goes on? Or, or is it something where, like, every day you look at that ring and you're like, yes, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think um, it did t- It did take a long time uh, for me to be like, okay, cool, I got it. Um, but never, I never downplayed it. Like, it's it's a huge deal. Like, my favorite player of all time is, is Barry Sanders, and he doesn't have one, you know? Um and I'm sure like millions of guys wish they did uh, because it's, it's really, it's the pinnacle when it comes to a, a team, you know, obviously he's, he reached the pinnacle. He's in the hall of fame as a player, but as a team, right. To, to do that. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's super cool. And, and it was the dream, you know, to have my father there, to have my wife there, to have my son there. Um, everyone was there and, and to have them on the field. So it was really uh, like a movie um, because it's, it's really, it's that difficult. And I haven't even been after that. I haven't even been close. I won. I've been to the playoffs with, with different teams, but never been close like that because it's that hard. Right. What is it about playing with uh, some of these great quarterbacks that you teamed up with? Because I mean, you're with Brett Favre at the end of his career, right? And then you're playing with Eli when he's well, Tom Brady's crypt. Yep. And then and then the Giants during the like Tom Brady kryptonite years. Um, you also got, you know, Russell Wilson. Um, what is it like playing with those guys? I mean, they all have documentaries and stuff about them now. Like, like, what's Eli like in the locker room? Is he, is he like an aloof guy like we see him in the media, or is he in there pulling up in Ferraris, bumping Jeezy, or like I just Definitely I don't know not. who these yeah, know, people really are. <laughs> yeah, well, I will say like, okay, you take Favre, Rogers, you take Russell, you take Eli. And right, those are like the upper, upper echelon. I mean, obviously, Eli, um, in terms of winning Super Bowls. And I, I mean, and I'm gonna say this I, I play with Kirk Cousins too. And the reason why I'm throwing his name just in this conversation is because the, the number one thing, um, I would say the two things for a franchise quarterback is one is availability. You know, these guys, these guys don't miss games. You know, I think Eli missed his first start because McAdoo benched him. Um, and, these guys don't miss games. They're available for their teams. Well, 16, now 17 weeks out of the season. Uh, I think Kirk Cousins finally missed a game because of, um, I think he tested positive for COVID or something like that. But these guys don't miss games. And at the same, and then the other thing is they're really, they're consistent. You know, you know, you know what kind of quarterback you have. So when you have a guy who's available, who's consistent, like that is the mark of a franchise quarterback. That's why all these dudes are, are paid um, and, and will always have a job. So, for for me, that's what I learned from from every single guy, and they were all they were all unique in their own way. They like these are all unique personalities with Favre and how he is, and how Aaron Rodgers is, you know, uh, how Russell is, and uh, Eli. It's funny I name all these guys: Favre, Rodgers, Russell, Eli, and Kirk, <laughs> and, and people just talk about their personalities. How they, you know, they're always being made fun of in social media. So. Uh, yeah, that's why I, that's why I'm guys. wondering, like, you know, what is what is something that you're privy to in the locker room? Like, you know, um, we have a lot to talk about, but maybe for one of those guys, something that stands out that you're like, man, I never forgot that moment when Brad or Eli did this or said that. Yeah, well, I remember with, the one that stood out to me was with Favre. He um, 
you know, he and I had nothing in common, but we were on the same team. He's, you know, almost in his 40s. I'm 21 years old. So I never talked to him. I had no, I wasn't a receiver. I wasn't on offense. I had no reason to, to talk to him. And I remember 2007, after we played the Raiders, uh, I ended up having two special team touchdowns that game. And I remember walking through the tunnel. No, excuse me. I was walking after changing to go home. And I heard someone yell my name like, Will, Will, William. You know, and he said, William. And I turned around because no one calls me William. And it was him. It was Brett. And he was like, hey, man. He's like, yo, Will, right? I was like, yeah, Will. By the way, this is like November, December. He's like, yo, Will. I was like, yeah. He said, hey, man. He said, oh, great job today. And um, to me, that was that was huge because I, I never talked to the dude, really. You know, he was untouchable. and never, Not untouchable in terms of like he was unapproachable, but untouchable because he was like that that much of a legend. Um, so uh, that's what stood out to me uh, the most uh, because it was unexpected. You know, I was fortunate to play with Charles Woodson. He, we were the same position group, so I got to talk to him all the time. And now he and I are close friends. And actually, uh, I was watching an interview of yours, and you were talking about how Charles would like, you know, look out for you all and say, "Yo, let's let's get suited up, hit the town." You know, I'm a, I'm gonna show you guys like how to maneuver through this situation. Um, and that made me think of as well with the quarterbacks playing with these icons. I say about the end of every year, we get a a headline about somebody got Rolexes for the whole team or something like that. Um, I'm curious just because you were playing with, again, those type of legends that you hear those stories with. And is it like, you know, anybody popped up with something or is that just like media hype and it doesn't, it's not that big of a deal? Or is it like, no, man, these legends actually, there's some unique situations that happen uh, just because you're part of that group. Yeah, what's funny is when I was in Green Bay, um, dudes were, were, you know, pretty wealthy and successful in the team. But we were also in Wisconsin. So nobody was bringing their Lambo to Wisconsin. Nobody was bringing their <laughs> Bentley or Ferrari to Wisconsin. Everyone had Tahoes and Escalades and, and what have you. So um, everyone was pretty modest for the most part. Uh, it was it was, it was was super – it was really cool to see um, – I remember when Charles, when I first saw Charles Woodson, he was leaving the locker room. I'm like, oh, I know he's driving something dope. You know what I'm saying? So I was, you know, I was in the parking lot looking to see, like, what's what's he going to get into? Because I, I never, you know, I'm from Rhode Island. I've really never seen uh, cars like that. So I'm, I look, I look. This is real creepy, by the way. I look like I see him get into his car. And he gets into, like, a Chevy Blazer. And I was like, I was like, bruh. Like, thinking to myself, I was like, He's probably saving his money. That's what he's doing. Like he's probably, and he was just smart with it. You know, he he drove that around when he when he got signed, and he ended up. I think he had like a Lincoln sponsorship, so he had a truck uh, with them. But but he always kept it chill. He didn't wear anything crazy. He didn't have any crazy jewelry. He he actually cut his own hair. Like he was the most modest, chill superstar I have ever been around my entire life. Um, Did that start? like rubbing off on you or tea because you know you made we can look up you know you made your millions uh from playing in the nfl and you know there's a lot of information out there now about i think people are being more conscious understanding how to manage money you know i see some of these rookies come in talking about i'm only spending my endorsement money and i'm trying to save and that's been like a mentality that i think people have been working to try to get to take hold for, for decades now. And it might, I'm yeah. sure people still stunt, but it's starting to break through. But as someone who got to see seven figures, got to touch an amount of money that may have seemed unfathomable to you at a time or still does to some people, you know, what did you learn about how fast it can come, how fast it can go, what you need to do to hold on to yeah, it? Yeah, it, it can go, it can go super quick because uh, you think about it. You're in, you're in you're in college. My sake, I was there for four years, and I was there just you know took the core classes, then took my my uh, degree in English classes, and then and played football. <clears throat> not, not at one point where there's a legit like financial literacy training. You know what I'm saying? So then you take a 21 year old kid. Um, you know, I go from free education, taking classes, playing football, to now okay, I get drafted. I gotta buy a house. I gotta buy a car. I gotta do this. I gotta pay this person i gotta handle all these things i gotta handle all these bills but then i still gotta go and prepare for an nfl game on sunday because at the end of the day that's that's all that matters um so that that part um i guess was the 
was the most difficult and, and challenging when it came to things like that. So <clears throat> that's why it's it's cool for guys nowadays because you you can get endorsement and you can get um, that type of money before you know before you actually get paid. Um, I know it's way more difficult for like especially back then for defensive players to to get anything uh, in terms of like endorsement money because you're not scoring touchdowns. Just for the sake that I played, I played offense in college a little bit. I was able to do a lot of endorsement stuff. And, you know, I ended up was able to buy my first car before I even got drafted um, because I got endorsement money. But I know for defense, it's hard. But nowadays, I mean, with social media platform, you can get so many different deals going on for you. I mean, now, obviously, the NIL, you can get money doing that. So you can be Guys a kicker get, and, and have good yeah. money if your social's on point, you know? Yeah. And so now, now, now people are aware of that, you know, learning investments and, and, um, you know, training and, and understanding that part is more prevalent now because I think guys are truly understanding that, you know, I need to learn how to have my money make money versus like my money just sitting there and I just got this in the bank because that can go instantly. Is there um, a win or a lesson that you have that you're particularly proud of that maybe you could give some game to somebody? It's like, bruh. I copped a bunch of restaurants or I put my money just in the S and P 500 stock market. Like, um, you know, what's something that, that you would, that you would say was like a real come up for you. I would say the biggest come up for me was, um, when I had those financial meetings with, with my financial advisor, like listen, ask questions and take notes. Like, like really understand what he's saying. Cause sometimes like earlier when I was younger, I had meetings and he's like, okay, this is what it is. This is where we are. Like he always told the hard truths. Um, you know, even if we were doing just fine, you know, he, he would give us the scariest scenarios. So sometimes I hated talking to him uh, because he made it feel like we can go broke tomorrow, you know, and he would scare the hell out of us. And so I was fortunate, but that was good. I, I had someone that was, that was honest with us. Um, I still have him. Who's Don't let these us. commas fool you. Yeah, not- <laughs> like, like, yeah, like he kept it. A, he kept it a hundred and always scared us and uh, really taught us to, uh, even if you felt like you were okay, to still like budget and really stretch, you know, your money out for a, a, a long time. Because especially, yeah, once you're done playing, you're not making that anymore. You know, I don't care what it is, unless you're, you know, making money and investing like LeBron. Like you're not making that type of money anymore. Um, when you're done playing. And so he, he, I really, um, really got to just sit there and listen and, and, and understand that part. So I would say that's, that's the biggest advice I can give. Is there like push. one investment though, that had a crazy return? There wasn't no, cause I didn't, I didn't get into it until late. You know, that was the thing for me too, because I didn't, I was so all in on football, um, that, you know, I didn't really put the time into really understanding. So that's my other advice too, is like, Hey, while you have it, while you have the capital, like, yeah, just, you know, chip away at some little things. You know, there's a company that I, I work with, I'm not an investor, but I, I work with uh, RX3 Ventures and that's what, you know, Aaron Rodgers and Nate Raby and, and Roth, they start this company and they, they raise funds uh, to invest in the consumer goods. So this is a great platform that they have for athletes to get a part of. Um, I think Brady just started a new one. So there's ways for guys to, if when you have the capital, yeah, just, you know, I would say just dive in on certain things. And um, so that's, those are the two things I would say is really have an honest and, and learn from your financial advisor. And then also while you're playing and while you have the capital, like, yeah, start like looking and, and understanding, especially now it's the off season, you know, um, like that's where you can value your time there. Get ahead of it. Yeah. Well, um, I think even though you say you started a little later, you have something really excited going on with this wine business right now. One last football question, just as a fan, and I was living in New York at the time. You all won this chip, so I got to see how the city reacted. Um, but what was it like on the other side of the team? Like, you know, anything legendary that you remember from a party standpoint? Did this a guy like Elon, who I, or not Elon? <laughs> A guy like Eli, who I assume is, you know, pretty serious, uh, you know, did you see him like loosen up in a a way you never had before? Like what is what actually happens? We see the TV, we see the ceremony, we see I'm going to Disney World and we might see some pictures from a party or something. But like, 
what is that camaraderie and what is that feeling between the team for that next 24 hours that next week you know before yeah you i would say home? i would say even before the game even started you know coach coughlin who you know was known for being real stern and being you know a military type leader uh before the game he gave us a speech the night before and he was he was really emotional um before before the night before just just explaining i'm expecting this rah rah speech but he just went around the room and expressed his love to all of us you know and i think that was just a prime example of why we were a, a close team able to handle adversity so now after the after the game bro everything happened so fast you know what i'm saying you don't i just remember kid rock was performing and then we had my wife and i had to go pack at like four in the morning so we were just, everything just happened so quickly um but i remember the parade was was a lot of fun um you know i, I remember after the game after we won i'm in the locker room you know getting ready to change and you know before I change, I'm hanging out with like Seal and Heidi Klum. Like they're in the locker room. Like everybody was in the locker room after the game. So it, that, that, there were just so many little things that happened, but it happened so quickly. So it's it's hard to remember like those little details about certain players because I was I mind my I was observant, but I also mind my business a lot too. All right. Well, there's nothing ever wrong with that. Well, speaking of business, how do you make that transition? You reach the pinnacle in the NFL. Yeah. And you have an interest in wine. Now you're the wine MVP. How did you get to this point? Well, like I mentioned that, you know, I, I wish I got into more uh, ventures while I was playing. But what I did do is I actually started studying and taking classes um, in the wine space. Uh, I, I took the WSET, which is a wine education uh, program. So it's Wine and Spirit Education Trust. I ended up taking that uh, exam in the level two and ended up passing that one. And then I also took the uh, CMS, which is quarter master's and certified level one, and ended up passing that as well. And my interest just grew. Like I been consuming wine the whole time I was there. Um, the first person, again, I keep mentioning Charles Woodson. He was the first guy I saw that was um, actually in the wine space early. I think his first vintage is like 2004 or five. And so it was cool to see someone I admired playing, someone African-American and someone who was actually in the, in the wine business. I, I thought it was untouchable. I was like, how do people get into the wine space? I thought you had to be born in something like that. So that right there opened a lot of eyes for me. And I got I got excited about wine the same way I got excited about football. And it was like the, the stories, the history, all those things. Sure, the lifestyle is fun. But for me, it was more about like the actual dirt, the terroir, the climate, the regions. Like I really enjoyed that whole deal, the process of winemaking. So that's why I, I started like getting more interested and started studying it. And then eventually, you know, when you're done, you're like, okay, well, what am I going to do? Like I didn't want to go coach after playing 12 years and traveling away from my family a lot. I didn't want to go coach. I do. I did have front office interest, uh, no pun intended, uh, but, but I, we'll take it. I, yeah, we'll take it. <laughs> and I, I still, I still do. I get, I get inquiries now to potentially be in the NFL team front office. So I, I do listen to those. Uh, I do some TV media, but I'm like, like what's really going to like fire me up. And for some we for some reason it was it was the wine world you know I was super passionate about learning and understanding that stuff, and my initial thought was hey you know maybe I can start my own wine label and I spoke to a lot of people about that I have a group of wine dads some successful wine businessmen they're like you have the best grapes the best wine whatever it is at the end of the day can you sell the wine and I thought that was interesting and so I started doing more research and then it dawned on me I'm like gosh I have such a unique network of athletes and celebrities and high net worth and ultra high net worth executives um, where I can just be the middleman for them and and create this company where I can just hold their hand in the whole wine process. So that's where the wine MVP was born. And initially I started doing wine cellars and I just started calling my buddies, you know, because I just started this company and I called like like Reggie Bush and Matt Ryan. I, those are the first two sellers that I curated. Um, and it was cool because I um, when there was an article that came out about me in USA Today, I think Mike Jones wrote it. And when it came out, my phone just blew up. Like the first two people I got that contacted me was uh, Stan Kroenke's people and Drew Bledsoe. And I thought that was super cool, like to get that support, you know, because it's such a it's not even talked about that much how NFL players are involved with wine. You hear about LeBron and, and, and Carmelo and D. Wade and Chris Paul, like how they're. DJ Reddick, how they're involved. CJ McCollum got one. Now, well, yeah, so. CJ. I'm saying he, yeah, CJ McCollum came through like having his own. I can, I can go on. CJ McCollum, Chandler Fry, Josh Hart, like there's a bunch of dudes. Uh, Mello just came out with his own wine, 
and you hear that, but you don't hear much about football. So it was cool to see all those guys come through and, and support. And so I started curating sellers. And then eventually I did come out with the wine club. Uh, but the biggest part of the business for me has, has been the concierge curating part. So whether it's private events, whether it's uh, curating trips, um, whether it's personal buying, like those are the things that I do. And that's, it's really fun. Has is connecting with so many different people um, globally and has taken me there uh, globally and just, just meeting people. So that was, and that was super cool for me because I'm sure you, you heard about it so many times that the hardest part is when you're done. Um, because it's, it's like taking the hamster off the wheel. It's like, now what, regardless how successful you were, how many all pros, how many millions, how many, whatever it is, when you're done, it is effing hard. It's so hard. Tom Brady can't even come to terms Bro, Tom with Brady. it. <laughs> Tom Brady, well, he he messed up, man. Tom Brady went to a damn Christian Ronaldo game uh, match, and I think Ronaldo had a hat trick, and he was like, "Man, f this, I, I'm gonna come back." And I missed this energy. But it, you have, it did is, you see the is, clip? Did you see the clip of like them talking after the game? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. but you could tell. I think when that hit the internet, everybody was like, "Is he really retired?" Because I mean, yeah, the great one of the greatest soccer players ever asked you. He's like, "Ah." Uh, you know, it's not like he was like, yeah, bro, I did what I had to do. Nah, <laughs> he was like, no. He, it's the, he had his best season ever, and they didn't win the Super Bowl. He's like, Psh, I still got action. You know, and he yeah. he said he also said a long time ago he's going to retire when he sucks. So, clearly, he's not even close to that yet. But I, I but, think, um, regardless, he's a good example of, like, you can have seven rings, you can make all the money in he the has world. Every re- he has no reason to keep playing. None. And yet... It's in there, you know. Yeah, it's in there. So and, you and felt because, you felt that, and you had to. Yeah, because the hard part is, I had to like now for the first time in thirty years, I had to make my own schedule. <laughs> like that, it's crazy, right? Like I knew, I knew when the season was when it was over. I knew when we had to be back. I knew when I should start training. I know when our. I know OTAs. I know. I know mini camp. I know training camp. I knew. I knew the whole calendar. I knew who we were playing. Every year, you know, I just I knew these things because our schedule was already planned um, since I was six years old. It was planned. So to create my own schedule to learn how to be a businessman, an entrepreneur, that's the hardest thing unless unless you've been doing it and someone taught you. So I actually I actually went back to school. I went to Sonoma State uh, in, in California and they have a wine business program. And that, that was like a two year program that I went and took and, and completed that. Um, and I'm actually, I went back into school because it's funny how, how it works. I'm, I started a wine club and then they have a course called how to make a wine club profitable. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, of course, of course y'all going to send that my way. So right. I'm, I'm in that right now. So, uh, yeah, dude, it's for me, it was, I think the, the common denominator is I was always trying to educate myself so I can make the best decisions for what I want to do. You know, it, it's a slow burn for me because I want it done properly um i'm learning all these things about running a business and um just learning on it just through trial and trial and error and um and just truly and truly understanding and loving the process so that's 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 what's been cool Uh, i've been very fortunate to have found a passion where i'm willing to go for it you know i'm not a big quote guy and i saw a quote from kevin hart he said the he said it's easy to, to give up right it's easy to quit something and i heard that millions of times he said but what's difficult is to to get up, give 110%, he said, and nothing happened. He said, and to get up the next day, he said, you give 110% again, and nothing happened. He said, you keep doing that in succession, and nothing happens. He said, that's the real grind. That's the real grind, where you don't get the immediate result, the instant result, and, and you're still like, okay, I'm going to go for it. Because I did I did go through a rough patch when I first started the company. You know, startups is hard. You lose money, and things aren't happening, or you're not, you're not, nothing's profitable. And this is like a good like four months where it was just a rough patch. And then I just remember I was still excited to get up and go for it, you know, and that's that's how I measure passion. If I'm if I'm going through adversity, I'm still willing to work for it and work through it. That's how I know I'm doing the right thing, you know, and that's I think I learned that from football. I had nine surgeries when I played in 12 years. And, you know, I know guys who had one knee surgery and they retired uh, because it was so difficult to come back from from a mental standpoint. But. I just I just knew I was here for a reason, and I end up, you know, through the grace of God, end up finding resources to get my body healthy to play twelve. So, a lot of this has been synonymous, man, on, on how I've been going through this journey. But it's it's super fun, it's super cool. I got a lot of good people around me. Yeah, what is 
from a business standpoint, you know, that's what FOS were all about. I have to admit, and I think some other people might have this same question. It's almost like, like, what really is the business that you're doing? Like, I understand you're doing personal shopping, you're doing all these different things that you mentioned. But I think a lot of people, they hear it and it's just like, oh, you don't have your own wine. So so what is right, this yeah. kind of like? You just got this little halfway company talking about wine, which I'm right. not trying to, you, no disrespect. No, it's no, not no. that I think that. It's more just like, can you explain to people how there's really opportunity? Right, like, what's, like what's scalable? Being, right. What's scalable about your business? Yeah. Right, that's the, that's because I, I even see it. And I'm just like, okay, this guy knows his wine. He's connected, but that's not just like sales versus inventory. Right, and, right. and so how does, how does one turn that into a business and scale it and turn a profit? Right. It's the, like, what's the business model, right? It's like, he's, he's just out here just hanging out at wineries and, and giving guys wine. Like, what is he doing? So the, the biggest part of the scale part of business is the wine club. And that's gonna, well, I'm relaunching that in September. Uh, it's going to be a high end three tier, just DTC direct consumer. Just go on there, subscribe. Um, uh, we're going to have a, a starter level, all pro level, the MVP level, and all high-end different tiers. And so it's literally just going to be you go to that club, you sign up, and that's going to be the scalable part of the club. Um, and that's the part that has the business model. That's where, you know, in the long run, that's the one that's going. So, right, I do the concierge stuff. Like, that's the that's like the top of the ladder, right? The bottom part of the model is like, hey, sign up, be a member of this club. It's a subscription model club. Um, and then how, and the biggest thing too, how do you, how do you build a club where then you, you build it with the community and that's where the events and the personal conscious, all these things is, is involved too. So that's the model is the subscription model. So is there, um, any good conversations or maybe a, over a glass of wine that you've had, uh, with some of these other guys, because the culture has changed, like. I was just talking to um, another episode that we did for this. It was someone who was into motorsports and auto racing, and they've been doing this for like 20 years. And it's like, wow, I used to say to people, I like Formula One, and they'd be like, what is that? Like, is it NASCAR or something? Now you got superstars down in Miami. You know, everybody's into F1. Everyone's watching the Grand Prix. And I feel like right. wine has gone through something similar culturally where it was like, you know, it was the guy with the notes set the, which I'm sure you still have your swirling the wine. Yeah, yeah no doubt about it. I, yeah. I, I know. I've seen the interviews. I know you you can tell us the notes and the oat. And no, the oat. but I'm saying like I'm saying like being around those people. Like I I get it. You know, right. I, I went to a I went to a dinner in London, and it was all these dudes like all high level guys, and I know they were like ah he's here because he's a pro athlete. You know what I'm saying? Like they they that's what they thought, and yeah, for the most part that is the truth. But then once I started talking, you know, about it, they were like, oh, like this dude actually, you know, now I need to ask him what's going on. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. What have you seen culturally, culturally to see, okay, everybody has a wine now, you know, like rappers will flex wine. Like this was, you were in a beer town, you know, this was, you started playing when it was like, hey, you know, what bottle of vodka or whatever do i have like the game has changed so much it's cool it's legitimately cool nobody thinks it's for old stuffy rich guys it's like i'll hang out with the bros you can go play a card game people are like yeah what i give a shoot i give a lot of credit to i would say like again lebron and those guys you know even though you know they're cracking bottles that no one's gonna buy you know because they can't they can't get it but a big part of you know them documenting in and via social media i think that's when the, that's been the biggest thing is just seeing that and now i feel like you know i mean lebron's a he's an absolute cultural shifter you know when he's doing stuff and that alone i think it was it was a reminder of how charles woodson made me feel comfortable back then when i was drinking wine and beer and beer country like absolutely same thing like all these nba dudes are are really documenting like their style in terms of what they're doing what wine like yeah, LeBron's gonna sit back with a do rag and drink some, you know, DRC because he because he can. Um, you know, Jay Z. You know, he was probably the first guy culturally like try to make it cool like that. But people, the only thing with Jay Z is you know he raps about stuff that again like LeBron was posting like we can't get you know like Cristal's or champagne you know that, like that's wine you know what I'm right. saying. Um, but 
yeah, it just it just became more culturally normal due to, in my opinion, due to a big part of that. And then, and that's kind of where you know I would say I came in into that kind of space. But mine was just more so from an educational standpoint, where it's like, hey, if something if you don't understand something, that's the most part too. Is like a lot of people of color when they get to the wine space or they're afraid to, is because they just you know they don't they don't it's unapproachable. They don't understand. Where it's like, bro, at the end of the day, this it's just fermented grape juice, like everybody can relax, you know, and that's kind of where my voice is in this wine scene. So even when I talk about wine, I talk, I talk how you and I converse right now. Um, I, I just keep it real basic, simple and talk about my vulnerabilities because I was not born into a wine family. I had to, I had to like learn this and earn this. Um, and that's the, that's the fun part about really adding to this culture. Yeah. And people seeing that, you know, it breaks down barriers. I think a lot of times we put limits on ourselves and we say, right. we say, I, cu- I couldn't be the guy who knows how to you know, taste wine properly and stuff. And like you say, you realize there's no reason that I can't be that person. I think I, that's what I love about your story. Did you, have you had any of these conversations with, with, I know like for instance, a Woodson, but I don't know, you ever talked to LeBron, you ever send him a DM like, bro, what is this? Or catch him at the all-star game or something, or, or any of the other NBA or NFL players who are really getting serious about wine you know y'all got a group chat or something going like what's yeah up? so not not a group chat but there is you know we do a converse like i i end up meeting up with josh hart in london uh we went to six seven paul mall we got to talk about things because he's a big you know big wine guy um jj reddick so i'm on a board um of a company called um inventory and it's a you know a wine management app and it's, it's like the new innovation one so i'm on the board of that company and, you know, my job is to try to get other athletes involved and JJ Reddick and actually Josh Hart, they both invested uh, into this company. And I'm also on the board of uh, Knocking Point Wines as well. And, you know, owned by uh, Steve Amell, uh, Andrew Harding and uh, Ashton Kutcher, you know, they're all part of that too. So there is that wine culture of athletes, celebrities that are, you know, monetizing it and, and, and doing well with that. So speaking to them, uh, I had a couple of conversations, with, you know, not with LeBron, but with Maverick Carter, because obviously he's, you know, he's right there popping well. the bottles too. tell yeah, us about right the, the, the Mav convo, just because he's part of that circle that's made wine. So yeah, accessible. so it, it, it was it was real brief. It was just we didn't have an actual sit down and talk for a long time. It was just more so like, hey, let's let's like meet up in you know LA somewhere and like let's converse because there's a lot of synergies here. So I think that's the big thing is just trying to um, just have these conversations and, and try to help one another. You know, I, I was asked to be the uh, U.S. ambassador for this company called Liquid Icons, um, which is uh, a nonprofit based in the U.K. and they you know they raise money every year to give scholarships and wine for people of color uh, globally. And every year they have an event called the Golden Vine Awards, uh, where it's like the Oscars for wine. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting involved in a lot in terms of in that regard. So, um, you know, that's that's been the fun part is I have. So to, to answer your question, yes, I have been investing, either, whether it was financially investing or, you know, this equity uh, type of uh, situations that I've been involved in. So, yeah, so that's. That's been the cool part to actually be like that, though, in the wine space. That's what's fun. Nice. Um, well, I really appreciate your time today. I got a couple more things before we get out of here. Um, one, what is it that people who aren't as educated as you maybe don't really realize about wine? Like, like I don't know, to set the scene here, for instance, I always have grown up knowing, hey, it's older is better, older is better. And I have seen people flex stuff from 50, 60, 70 years ago. Right. Mm-hmm. But I also know that, like, sometimes that's more of a flex and that's not really what it's all about. Right. And sometimes you see people pull out, like, a 2009 that's actually, like, the best thing ever. Or just what is the true context behind aging and, like, what's like the best type of bottle that you could pull out if you could just explain it to the average person? Right. I mean, if you're, if you're new in the wine and you pull out a bottle of Screaming Eagle, that's like, you know, 10 to $15,000. That's a flex, right? That's, that's clear. Especially if you're not posting stuff like that all the time. Um, now, if you're connected to a winery or connect to a certain year, or if you're, if you're really in it and there's like, Oh man, like, you know, the, the year of 76, you know, was was pretty dope. And I want a piece of that history. It's like, oh, like, okay. Like, I remember in football, when we beat Notre Dame, 
like Notre Dame was such a historic state. I remember people like literally ripped out pieces of grass and took a home with that because like it's such a historical piece. And so you have that too. But at the end of the day, like when it comes down to it is the the best wine. Actually, I was, I spoke at the symposium in Sacramento last year, um, this wine symposium. And someone asked me like, before I went in, they say, Hey, what's like, what's the best wine? I said, the best wine honestly is, is the one you currently like. Um, it, everything all depends, you know, people ask me like, what's my favorite? What do I like? And I'm a, it depends. I'm a mood drinker. Like whether if it's hot outside, I'm not touching red wine. I want something fresh. I want something refreshing and, and, and cold. If I'm having like steak, maybe I'll have a cab. If I'm having this, maybe I'm having this. Like it all, it all depends. There's no right or wrong. I still will crush beer in a heartbeat. You know, that was, I was a Napa drinking beer this weekend. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. So it, it all depends, you know, and you have people who are in particular, you know, they don't, they don't want the big, bold, you know, Napa cab. So they go more to like Bordeaux. They want more structure and less alcohol um, or people want more alcohol. You know, people are afraid of the, they keep mentioning the sulfites in wine where I'm like, that's not, that's not what gives you the headache. It's dehydration and, and alcohol because there's, there's more sulfites in, in canned fruit. If you look it up, like that's the most, you right. see a chart. Wine is like here at the bottom and then canned fruits is like way up here with French fries. So at the end of the day, man, I tell people my best advice is um, one, but I, I buy to try. So if you're curious, say I'm going to spend, you know, 60 bucks today, then buy four bottles in the $20 range because there's plenty of great wines there and just try all those, you know, have a little wine party and just try. You got to keep trying stuff because sometimes someone could recommend something and you're like, ah, you know. Am I forced to like it? Like when you go to a wine, like you go to a go have dinner in the Somalia, it's like, hey, try this. Like, this is one of the best wines. If you don't like it, you don't like it. It is what it is. Right. What is what is something crazy that one is privy to once they start getting into these like deep wine circles? Like, you know, I love talking to athletes who can tell you, yeah, it looks this way on TV, but here's what it's really like in the locker room on the field, etc. And I think everyone just thinks wine. Let's go to the wineries and stand around in suits and talk about how it has, you know, tones of oak and lavender or whatever people say. But like, have you been in some rooms? You've been out in France or something where it's just like, oh, my God, like, I didn't realize it was really like this. I didn't realize people spent this much money. I didn't realize, you know, culturally. I'm at someone's house from the 1700s. Like I, I'm making stuff up sort of, yeah. but I also no, no, know no, no. those no, things but, are in the realm. No, but you're right. Like, yeah. I think the cool part is when you actually go, like go to these wineries and hear these stories, like hear the stories. Um, uh, that's the part where I, that I'm always blown away with is hearing the stories, hearing the details, hearing like, you know, part of this winery was here. Or this guy used to live in Italy and brought, he designed the same lake he used to sit outside of in Italy. He designed it same here in Napa. Like, those are the things that's super cool to me is, is, is seeing that and hearing those kind of stories is, is why you hear, how did you get to this point? Hearing that, that's the part that that's always mind boggling. Um, and because yes, we're talking about wine, but at the end of the day, it's about the people. And if you can be in this wine space and, and you, you understand that it's about the people first and then the wine, um, then you'll go, you'll go a long way. You know, I'm in this space, anything I come into, whether it's football, business wine i i come with no ego you know i'm here just i want to i want to help how can we work together how can we make money together how can we share how can we continue to build this community um and i think for me that's why i was able to play so long i think that's why i was able to cultivate a lot of relationships in the wine space and i think that's why um you know i'm, I'm headed in the right direction in terms of what i'm doing but will you gotta flex on us like once like What's the craziest thing you've seen? So, like, I have no idea what the the high is. You know, is there yeah. people spend millions? Do they open? No, I mean, I I have a neighbor who who does spend millions on wines, and and so he'll, you know he'll come over and just he'll. I hate I hate going into my friend's cellars, and they're like, open whatever you want. You know, I'm like, bro, I'm, I know how much that one costs. I'm not gonna. Oh, let's open it. So you know, just well, what type of ones do you come across? Like, you know, what is what do you you mentioned the. Ten to fifteen thousand dollar bottle, which I get as a flex. But what are those so sort of like? There's only a few people in the world. One time I was sitting down, someone pulled out something that was fifty years old, and it was a hundred thousand dollar bottle. Uh, you know, you may not have had those things, but just you know, you're the man. You're the wine MVP. So I'm like, 
what's that kind of mind blowing bottle, that mind blowing dinner that just like changed everything for you? Yeah, I mean, gosh, that's <clears throat> excuse me. I never had like I never had like a aha like crazy changing moment, you know. Um I did have have a buddy open like a two thousand nine was actually no, I take that back. I take that back. Good. I was in <laughs> London. Like my buddy opened a 2009 Latosh, and that's like a, I mean, DRC, that's like a $20,000 bottle. But I was in um, London with uh, this buddy. His name is Loic Pasquet. He's a winemaker at this company called Libier Pate. And he is he has the wine that's one of the last remaining pre-Phylloxera vineyards. And Phylloxera, just really quick, was a pest uh, that originated here in America. Um, but what it does, it latches onto vines and just destroys crops. And so it didn't destroy the crops here in the U.S. because we evolved with this pest. But when it went over to Europe, it just cleaned out so many wineries because it latches onto the roots and it kills the vines. Um, so a lot of people, so a lot of wineries, they take American rootstock and graft it because what it does, it protects the vine from phylloxera, and and it cleaned up Bordeaux, but this is one of the wineries in Bordeaux where it did not get affected by this phylloxera. So this is like the purest of the purest Bordeaux that you, you know, you can find in, in all the region. So he actually meet, he met me in London. We went to the steakhouse and he actually brought out this bottle um, that I think his 2015 goes for like 30,000 euros and he brought it himself. So to sit down with him and understand his story and one, why it costs so much and all that, that was, re- that was pretty cool for me. That was a big moment. Awesome. Well, if you could bring your worlds together, and I think this is a good note to end on, you have NFL, you played for over a decade, you got a ring, you played with many of the greatest players of all time, and now you're in this wine space teaching me things that I never heard anything about, and probably, you know, a lot of the people listening here. Uh, if you can, how do those worlds compare like like what is it something that you might have learned in football that you can apply to wine yeah it's it's what i mentioned earlier it's the it's the uh not having an ego and willing to learn um because every every vintage is different every season is different um every you know everything evolves and if you're willing to put your pride down and just be willing to learn not just about the wine but learn about the people um that, that goes a long way. So the cool thing for me is, you know, I work with a lot of classic wineries and a lot of young wineries because I'm able to, I'm able to mend that gap. I'm able to, you know, get the information and communicate with the, with the older crowd and then bring that information to the younger crowd and listen to the younger crowd and relay that back to the older crowd. So I get to like continue to mend both worlds because there is that disconnect of the baby boomers who are stuck in, and who are all about their brands versus like the young millennials that want, they want what's cool, what's new, what's, what's popping, you know, that kind of a deal. So I think for me, it just goes back to just, you know, be, be in the safety, right? Be in the safety. You're able to see everything and communicate with everyone and, and, and do that. So I think that's, that's for me is what's been happening. All right. Well, wishing you the best, much success with the wine MVP. Thanks for breaking it down in such detail for us today. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Yeah.